Amen. Amen. In December of 2010, I held a series of meetings in Karlsruhe, Germany. About 10 years earlier, I had held a series of meetings in the same city, actually in the same church. And unbeknownst to me, a non-Adventist who attended the first series of meetings also attended the second series of meetings as well. During the second series of meetings on a Wednesday evening, the meeting started on a Sunday night, he came up to me and he pointed at a handbill and uh, he said, when are you going to talk about this topic? And he pointed to a section in the handbill that said, what happens when a person dies? Now it just so happens that the pastor of the church had placed in uh, that handbill that I was going to speak about the state of the dead. But I did not give him that topic, and so he simply put it in there to attract the attention of the general public. And so uh, I told this uh, gentleman that I was not going to speak on that specific subject, but that if he wished, I would be glad to come to his house and explain to him what happens when a person dies. And uh, so we set up an appointment for two days later, and in the privacy of his home, uh, the pastor and I met this gentleman uh, at the kitchen table. Now, as we got acquainted, he shared with us that his wife had been a Jehovah's Witness for many, many years. And he had been attending the Kingdom Hall of the Jehovah's Witnesses with her for those many years, but he had never actually become a member of the Kingdom Hall of the Jehovah's Witnesses. At some point, he told us that he and his wife had a falling out with one of the elders of the church, of the Kingdom Hall. And so they quit attending church. Now, it's very important for us to realize, as I continue telling this story, that the Jehovah's Witnesses believe very similar to Seventh-day Adventists when it comes to the state of the dead. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the dead know not anything until the resurrection. In other words, they believe in the state of the dead just like Seventh-day Adventists do. And so, uh, as we talked there at his table, he was telling us the story about what had happened to his wife. It just so happens that five months before we arrived at his house, his wife had passed away after a devastating bout with cancer. They had been married for a period of 22 years, and he was disconsolate. In fact, as we sat there at the kitchen table, he cried his eyes out because he missed her so much. Now, as we sat there at the kitchen table, this gentleman told us that after his devastating loss of his wife five months earlier, he had searched for literature to help him with his grief that he was suffering. And through the recommendation of a friend, he came across the publications of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a Swiss psychiatrist, world-renowned in her time. Now, Kubler-Ross's extensive work with the terminally ill had led her to write a very famous book, and that book is called On Death and Dying, which was published in the year 1969. In this work, she spoke about five stages of grief that the terminally ill go through. And those five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally, acceptance. And she showed that most everybody goes through these five stages, not necessarily everyone in the same order, but everybody experiences, in one sense or another, what these stages. Now, I remember that I had the uh, privilege of listening to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, in 1972 speak at a nursing symposium at Andrews University, where I was going to school at the time. Now, in the late 1970s, Kubler-Ross became interested in out-of-body experiences and spiritualism. In fact, she began experimenting with the possibility of communicating with the dead. 
she came to believe that reincarnation is compatible with Christian doctrine. Now as we spoke with this 72 year old gentleman, he described how Kubler-Ross's works had become a great comfort to him in his time of grief. He told us that he now believed that when a person died, they would go through a dark tunnel, and after going through the dark tunnel, they would come out on the other side in a glorious realm of light where everything was peace and everything was love. He also told us that his dead wife had appeared to his friend, and according to the friend, she had the same appearance and spoke in the same voice and relayed a message to him that she was in a better place and she was enjoying the bliss of heaven. Now what was our response? We knew that we had our work cut out for us. And so I formulated a question to this gentleman. I said, more than anything, I assume that you would want to know that your wife is doing well and that she's in a better place. Is that true? He says, of course that's true. Then we showed him in the Bible how God had said to Adam and Eve that if they ate from the tree they would surely die, and how the devil had said that if they ate from the tree they would not surely die, but that they would live forever. We also shared with him the story of the witch of Endor to show biblically that the devil can disguise himself as departed individuals to try and deceive those who are alive. And we read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where it says that the devil disguises him, himself even as an angel of light. And then I personally presented to him a hypothetical case. I said, what if your wife suddenly appeared in that doorway over there? Let's suppose that she speaks with the same voice, she looks the same, and she remembers details of the times that you spent together, and she tells you that she misses you, but that she's in a better place. Would you believe that this is your wife? Because you desperately miss her, and you would like to be with her? Would you follow the testimony of your eyes, and your ears, and your heart, and your feelings, and believe that that is your wife, because she appears to be identical to what she was during the time that she was alive? Would This would be a most trying experience. Your eyes, your heart, your mind, your feelings, all tell you that this is your wife. Would you have the courage to look at that being that is appearing before you and to say, my heart says that you're my wife, my eyes tell me you're my wife, my ears tell me you're my wife, my feelings tell me that you are my wife, but the Bible says the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Would you be willing to go by what the Bible says rather than following the testimony of your senses and your emotions and your feelings? Well, his eyes open wide. And for what seemed to be an eternity, there was a period of silence. We prayed with him, ended the meeting, and this was on a Wednesday evening. The meetings ended on Saturday night, and he never came back to any of the meetings. I've often wondered what happened to this gentleman. I've wondered whether the contact that we made with him uh, was productive in the sense of leading him to think about what we had said to him. Because remember, he had attended the kingdom hall with his wife. And the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the dead know nothing. And so we were simply presenting the biblical scenario of what happens when a person dies. And so I wondered, did this man perhaps, after a period of reflection and thought, come to the conclusion that that was not his wife that was talking to his friend? Did he reach the conclusion that the dead know nothing? Now, the traditional acid test, you've heard of the acid test, right? That's an expression that we use. The traditional acid test is used to determine 
if a precious metal is gold, for example, or not. And how do you determine if a precious metal is gold? Well, what you do is you take a small drop of a strong acid, such as nitric acid, and you put a few drops on the surface of the metal. Now, most metals who are not precious, they, uh, they will fizzle. In other words, they will bubble or fizzle. But when you put nitric acid on gold, it doesn't fizzle at all. And this is a, a test that can be applied to a metal to determine whether it is gold or it is not gold. It is an inexpensive, decisive, immediate, and simple test to distinguish what might appear to be gold from that which is truly gold. You see, you can't rely on people telling you that the metal is gold. You can't rely on the idea that the metal looks like gold. You can't rely on tasting the gold. You know, have you ever noticed that people sometimes, you know, they bite the gold? I don't know if they're able to determine it's, it's gold by biting it. But anyway, that is not the way in which you should determine whether a, me a metal is a precious metal of gold or not. You can't go by your hunches. You can't go by your feelings. You can't go by what your senses say. You must apply an external test that will give you absolute certainty that that is really gold. If you don't, you, must, you might just purchase fool's gold. And you know fool's gold is actually counterfeit gold. It has absolutely no value. Now the Bible tells us that the devil is going to attempt to deceive the world at the end of time by getting them to follow their senses, their feelings, their emotions, and their ears instead of following what God says in His Holy Word. Let's read several verses in Scripture where we are told that the devil is going to attempt to deceive the whole world with signs and wonders that, appear to the sen that appeal to the senses and to the feelings and the emotions. Let's begin with Matthew 24 and verses 23 through 25. Matthew 24 and verses 23 to 25. Here Jesus is speaking about end time events, and he says this, Then, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show what? Great signs and wonders. What is the purpose of the great signs and wonders? To deceive, if possible, even the elect. And then Jesus says, see, I have told you beforehand. In other words, Jesus is saying, I've told you this beforehand so that you will not be what? So that you will not be deceived. The devil is planning to perform great signs and wonders. Among those signs and wonders is what is called spiritualism. Notice also Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14, where we are told that the devil is going to use signs and wonders to gather the whole world on his side in the final controversy. It says there in Revelation 16, verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing what? Signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world. And what is the purpose of these signs? It is to what? To gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. It is to gather them against the government of God and against God's people. So we're told that this threefold union, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, which we're not going to study in this particular series, we've studied in other series, they are going to perform signs and wonders with the intent of deceiving the human race and gathering everyone on the devil's side. And then, of course, we have Matthew 7, 21 to 23. You might be saying, well, these are going to be secular people that are going to be doing these signs and wonders. You know, they're not religious people. They certainly cannot be Christians. Are they Christians? Notice what we find in Matthew chapter 7 and verses 21 to 23. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Here Jesus is speaking. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Are these Christians that Jesus is talking about? Sure, because a non-Christian would not call Jesus Lord, Lord. Now notice what it continues saying, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Are these people who claim the name of Jesus? Yes. Notice, have, you, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? These are supposed Christians. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Or it could be translated, you transgressors of the law. So you, you have here Christians in the end time that are going to be prophesying, they're going to be casting out demons, they're going to be performing signs and wonders, and so people are going to say, oh, this, this certainly has to be from God. But Jesus says, I never knew them, because they practiced what? Lawlessness. In other words, they were transgressors of God's holy law, the Ten Commandments. So the big question that we need to ask is this. How can we keep from being deceived in this final conflict? The answer, folks, is that we need a detector outside ourselves that can show us what is true and what is false. We need an external standard outside of us in order to determine what is right, what is wrong, what is true and what is false, what is genuine and what is a counterfeit. You cannot trust anything inside of you. You cannot trust your eyes. You cannot trust your ears. You cannot trust your touch. You cannot trust your feelings, your heart, your emotions, your intuitions. None of that can you trust. No internal standards. We have to have an external standards like nitric acid to test things to find out if they are really of God. Our only safeguard, folks, at the end of time will be the same safeguard that God gave Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You see, the devil is going to do at the end time what he did at the very beginning. There's nothing new under the sun. So we need to go back to the beginning to understand how the devil deceived Adam and Eve. And then we'll know how the devil is going to attempt to deceive the world at the end of time. Because the devil said it worked back then, so why won't it work again? So I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17. Genesis 2 verses 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, who is setting the standard here? Who is telling Adam and Eve what is right and what is wrong? Is it their heart? Is it their eyes? Is it their ears? Or is it an external source, God saying, this is right and this is wrong. Eating from all of the trees, that's right. Eating from this tree would be sin. It would be wrong. The standard is not inside them to know good, what good, good and evil are. It is a standard outside of them. God is the one who is giving them the rule. He's saying, obey my word. But then the devil comes to Eve. And then later we're going to notice that he comes to Adam. Let's go to Genesis 3 and verses 1 through 6. Genesis 3 verses 1 through 6. We're going to fi find that the devil used five methods at the beginning to lead Adam and Eve astray from God. You know, God had spoken. Was this a simple test? Was it a test that was easy to understand? Yeah. God said his word was, don't eat from the tree. Adam and Eve sh simply should have said, well, eating from the tree is wrong, and so we'll just eat from the other trees. They should have obeyed the external standard that God had set. But now notice Genesis 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, question, do serpents speak? Of course not. Would it be a miracle for a serpent to speak? Of course. The devil is using a serpent and apparently giving it the quality 
of speech. But really the devil is using ventriloquism. This is the first ventriloquist of history. But he's performing a counterfeit miracle because an animal is speaking. A serpent is speaking. So the first method of the devil is to perform counterfeit miracles. Now notice what it continues saying. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, now is he going to quote God now? Is he going to quote what God said? Yes, actually he's going to misquote God's word. The second method that the devil uses is to misquote God's word. He doesn't quote it the way God said it. His purpose is to misquote the word. Notice what it continues saying. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is that what God had said? No. But is the serpent claiming to quote God? He's claiming to quote God, but he's misquoting God. Do you think the devil is going to use uh, misquoting God's holy word and changing God's word at the end of time to deceive? Absolutely. Now, do you know the reason why the devil misquoted God? Because he knew that Eve was going to correct him. He wanted to start a conversation. See, when somebody mentions something that you know is wrong, what is your first reaction? You say, no, 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 that's not what he said. And so the devil knows that if he misquotes God's word, immediately Eve is going to say, that's not what God said. And then you would have the beginning of a what? Of a conversation. And the serpent, the devil, wanted to converse with Eve because he knew that if he could converse with Eve, he would be able to get into her head. Now, notice then, first method the devil uses is a counterfeit miracle. Second method he uses is to quote God's word, but he misquotes God's word. Now the third method that the devil uses is the most trying of all. Let's go once again to Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And now comes the correction from the woman. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. And now she adds to God's word <laughs> because she's trying to defend the honor of God. So she says, uh, God has told us that we should not eat it, nor what? Nor touch it, lest we die. And it says in Patriarchs and Prophets that when she said that, the serpent plucked a fruit and put it into her hand and said, are you dead? Because she said that God had said that if she touched it, she would die. God had not said that they couldn't touch it. God said that they could not what? That they could not eat it. And so now we notice the third method that the devil used. Verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will what? You will not surely die. Now let's think a little bit about what the serpent is saying to the woman. What is the serpent saying about God? God is a what? As a, God is a liar. What do you suppose what the first thought of Eve was? God is a liar, so why did he lie? Right? Wouldn't that be the question in her mind? See, the devil is planting the question. Say, you're not going to die. And so Eve now is thinking, okay, if we're not going to die, then why did God tell us that we were going to die? I want to know. And so now you have the third method. The devil is now going to play games. He's going to lead her. He's going to lead her to reason independently of God. He's going to try and explain things that God had not explained. God didn't say why they couldn't eat from the tree. He simply said, don't eat. He didn't say that the tree has, the fruit is poison or anything. God said, simply don't eat. God gave no explanation. So the devil says, I'm going to give you an explanation. And notice what he says. For God knows, verse 5. For God knows, I'm going to give you the reason now. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your what? Your eyes will be opened. In other words, God wants you to be what? He wants you to be blind. You're blind. He wants blind service. He didn't explain things to you, did he? And what is happening with Eve's mind? Her mind is, is working overtime. Her reasoning powers are working overtime. And she says, I want to know more. What has God been hiding from us? God knows, 
something that he doesn't want us to know. He wants us to be blind. What is it? Is what her reasoning powers are screaming. So it says in verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like what? You will be like God. What is the devil telling Eve? He's saying, Eve, and this is, he's hinting at this. He's saying, Eve, do you know how God became God? By eating from the fruit of this tree, he got his powers. But after he ate from the tree and he discovered that this tree makes, makes a person God, he didn't want any rivals. He didn't want any competition. And so from that point on, he told everyone that if they ate from the tree, they were going to die. But God's concern was not that they were going to die. God's concern was that he would have some rivals just like him. Are you following me or not? In other words, Eve is now saying, Aha, now I have my reason. God didn't say why we shouldn't eat from the tree. Now I know God is selfish. God is lying to us. God wants us to be blind. God doesn't want us to be like him. Are you following me? And so what is the devil doing? He's leading Eve to reason and to use her logic independently of God. But now notice the devil says that she is going to be like God in a certain way. Let me ask you, who defines good and evil? Where do we get our definition of good and evil? Is that something that you find in your heart no. and in your brain? Your brain tells you what's good and evil. Your heart tells you what's good and evil. You can determine what's good and evil. No, 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 no. Who defines good and evil? God did. He said, you eat from all of the trees, that's good. Not from this tree, that's evil, if you eat from this tree. God defined good and evil. It's a source outside of us that defines good and evil. But what does the devil say to Eve? He says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, you don't have to depend on God to know what is good and what is evil. You can know that on your own, because you will be God. So the third method that the devil is using is he's playing mental games with Eve. He's, he's possessing her reasoning powers. He's using logic so that she'll follow her logic instead of following the word of God. And then I want you to notice what the fourth method that the devil uses. It says in verse 6, So when the woman saw, are her eyes involved? Yes. Were her ears involved to this point? Yes. So, so it says, so when the woman saw, that the tree was good for food. What sense is involved there? Her taste, that's right. That it was pleasant to the what? To the eyes. And a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit. What sense is being involved there? Her touch. She took the fruit and she ate. So what is the devil using? He's, he's leading Eve to follow this, the testimony of her what? Of her senses of her senses. And then I want you to know that it's the last method that the devil uses. Uh, in verse 6, at the end of the verse, it says, she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Let me ask you, does the devil use other people to lead other people astray? Absolutely. And so the devil used five methods. Number one, a counterfeit miracle. Number two, a misuse of scripture. Number three, a perversion of human reason. Number four, leading people to follow the testimony of their senses. And number five, used another person to lead a, a person into sin. Let me ask you, what was the only protection for Eve and for Adam at that point? Their only protection was to do what God said in his word. In other words, it was to ignore all of those things and to say, God said that we should not eat and we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Is the devil going to use these same methods at the end of time? You better believe he is. Is the devil going to use miracles? Yes, he is. Is he going to misuse scripture? Is he going to lead people to misuse scripture, to twist the scriptures, to add and to take away from scripture? Absolutely. Is the devil going to lead people to follow their reasoning powers, their logic? Yes, he is. Is he going to lead people to follow the testimony of their senses, what they see, what they feel, what they hear, their taste? Absolutely. And is he going to lead people to lead other people astray? He most certainly is. The same methods, methods that worked at the beginning, the devil is going to use at the end. 
Now the great detector, in other words, that God has given us is His Word. Pure and simple. And yet today, people accept all kinds of authorities in place of the Bible. Things such as science, philosophy, feelings, emotions, signs and wonders, tradition, what others say, among other things. All sorts of standards other than the clear, simple Word of God. And by the way, some of our own theologians in the Seventh-day Adventist Church today are saying that the Bible was fine for a pre-scientific, simplistic society. But today we have far more light and we're far more educated than those individuals who wrote Scripture. Ellen White made this sobering statement about what our source of authority should be. In Great Controversy, page 595, she says, But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, for its support. Amen. Jesus faced Satan's attacks in the wilderness by it is written. He did not follow his feelings, his emotions, his appetite, his senses. He simply said, I live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In Great Controversy, page 593, Ellen White expresses what the final delusion will involve. She says, the last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. Listen carefully to this now. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. So what is our source of authority at the end? It is God's written word. Pure and simple. A thus saith the Lord. Now one of the doctrines that we especially need to uphold from Scripture is the doctrine of the state of the dead. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19 is a very well-known verse among Seventh-day Adventists. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. We're very, very well acquainted with that particular verse. But have you read verse 19, the verse that comes immediately before? Why does it say to the law and to the testimony? Who is it that is, uh, who is referred to when it says, if they do not speak according to this word, there is no light in them? Actually, let's read verse 19 and see who they are. It says in verse, uh, verse 20, and when, actually verse 19, and when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, what are mediums? People who claim to be able to communicate with what? The dead. With the dead, that's right. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? And then you have that verse, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because, is because there is no light in them. Now the law would be the writings of Moses at this point, and the testimony would be the writings of the prophets that had written up till that point, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what Isaiah is saying is that everything needs to be tested by the written word of God. Now there are two doctrines that are corollaries among apostate churches today. The first of these is the immortality of the soul. And the second is spiritualism. These two doctrines are interconnected. It used to be that Christian churches believed in the immortality of the soul, but they rejected the idea that the dead can communicate with the living. 
but this has changed in recent years. It was only a matter of time until churches went from point A to point B, from the idea of the immortality of the soul to the possibility that the dead can communicate with the living. There are notable Christian leaders today who believe in OBEs, that is out of body experiences, as proof that there is life after death. And there are those who believe in NDEs, which is near death experiences, and they use this as proof that really it is possible for the dead to communicate with the living. They also use evidence from parapsychology, that so-called science which supposedly has proven that, that there is something communicating from the netherworld with those who live in this world. And incidentally, you know that most people in the world today believe that angels are the spirits of departed relatives who have died. The Bible tells us that the angels existed before the creation of the world. They are not the spirits of the dead that come back to this world. The Bible tells us that the angels were created by God before human beings. And yet in the Christian world today, the idea is that the angels are human beings that died and their spirits are coming back to help us here on this earth. The Bible is clear on the state of the dead. For example, Psalm 146 verses 3 and 4 says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, that is when you cease to breathe, he returns to his earth, in that very day his plans perish. The King James Version says, his what? His thoughts perish. There's no thinking, in other words, when a person dies. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5 says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know everything. Nothing. No, it says the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their memory is forgotten. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work, or device, or knowledge, or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And some Christians, they'll say, well, what about those texts that speak about being absent from the body and present with the Lord and uh, the rich man and Lazarus? Doesn't that prove that there's life uh, after a person dies and during the interim of death? Well, folks, I wish I had time to go into all of those texts. Fortunately, at Secrets Unsealed, we've produced a whole series called Misunderstood Texts on the State of the Dead. There are 12 presentations where we take all of these texts and we show that they are not teaching what most Christians think that they're teaching. We study them carefully within their context. Now the question is, how can we detect a counterfeit? The answer, folks, is very simple. The only way that we can detect a counterfeit is by knowing the genuine. How can you detect a counterfeit $100 bill? Do you have to know what the genuine $100 bill looks like to detect a counterfeit? Of course. How many of you ever have ever seen a counterfeit $4 bill? Anybody ever seen a counterfeit $4 bill? Oh, just think how much money counterfeiters could make if they had a counterfeit $4 bill. Why isn't there a counterfeit $4 bill? Because there's not a genuine $4 bill. You see, the genius of the counterfeiters is to copy the genuine as closely as possible in order to deceive, isn't it? And so what is our protection when it comes to detecting a counterfeit? You have to know the genuine in order to be able to detect, de detect a counterfeit. In the book Early Writings, pages 87 and 88, Ellen White has this remarkable statement. She says, I saw that the saints, that's God's people by the way, must get a thorough understanding of present truth, which they will be obliged to maintain from where? From the scriptures. They must understand the state of the dead, for the spirits of devils will yet appear to them, professing to be beloved friends and relatives, who will declare to them that the Sabbath has been changed. We've been talking about that, right? Also other unscriptural doctrines. Let me ask you, if you believe that the dead aren't dead and that they can com communicate with the living, will you accept what they say as being true? Most likely, yes. And then notice what she continues saying. They will do all in their power to excite sympathy and will wor work miracles before them to confirm what they declare. 
The people of God must be prepared. What is our protection? The people of God must be prepared to withstand these spirits with the Bible truth that the dead know not anything, and that they who appear to them are the spirits of devils. Our minds must not be taken up with things around us, but must be occupied with the present truth and a preparation to give a reason of our hope with meekness and fear. We must seek wisdom from on high that we may stand in this day of error and delusion. What will be the only protection for God's people? Trusting in God's written word. Let me read two or three other statements from this remarkable author. And by the way, modern spiritualism originated in the times of Ellen White. In 1848, in Rochester, New York, that is the official beginning of spiritualism. So she knew very well what she was talking about. Great Controversy, page 552. Speaking about the devil, she says, He has power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends. The counterfeit is perfect. The counterfeit is what? What is a perfect counterfeit? It's when the government can't even distinguish a counterfeit $100 bill from a genuine one. The counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many are comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven. And without suspicion of danger, they give ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In Signs of the Times, August 26, 1889, she says, It is Satan's most successful and fascinating delusion, one calculated to take hold of the sympathies of those who have laid their loved ones in the grave. See, to appeal to their emotions and their feelings is what she's saying. Evil angels come in the form of those loved ones and relate incidents connected with their lives and perform acts which they performed while living. In this way, they lead persons to believe that their dead friends are angels hovering over them and communicating with them. These evil angels who assume to be deceased friends are regarded with a certain idolatry and with many, their word has greater weight than the word of God. In the book Maranatha, page 209, she continues saying, they declared, that is apostate Christianity, they declared that they had the truth, that miracles were among them, that angels from heaven talked with them and walked with them, that great power and signs and wonders were performed among them, and this was the temporal millennium which they had been expecting so long. The whole world was converted and in harmony with the Sunday law. And this little feeble people stood out in defiance of the laws of the land and the laws of God and claimed to be the only ones right on the earth. Now do you know what the devil's capstone of deception is going to be? He is going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ. And for those who depend on their feelings, on their senses, on biblical arguments that others provide, on their emotions, they will be deceived by this counterfeit second coming of Satan. And you say, where does the Bible say that the devil is going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ? Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll go to verses 9 through 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 and verses 1 and 2. Now brethren concerning the coming, that's a very interesting word, it's the word parousia, remember that. Now brethren concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. Is Jesus going to gather to us or are we going to gather to Him? Our gathering together to Him, not Him to us, us to Him. We ask you, says the Apostle Paul, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying, Jesus hasn't come yet. That's what he's writing. And then he goes on in verses 9 through 12 to explain that the devil is going to counterfeit the coming of Christ. Now notice what it says in verse 9. The coming of the lawless one, do you know what that word coming there is? It's the word parousia. So is the, is, is the Antichrist also going to have a coming? Yes. Is it going to be before the coming of Jesus? Absolutely. 
So it says the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. And what is he going to come with? With all what? With all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because they did not receive what? What is our only protection? They did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Now listen carefully. It's not a lie. In the Greek it is that they should believe the lie. And you say what lie is this talking about? What has just the Apostle Paul been talking about? He's been talking about the counterfeit coming of the lawless one who will perform signs and wonders. That is the lie that will be accepted by those who don't receive the truth. So it says in verse 11, And for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe what? The truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. How important is it to follow the truth, to accept the truth, and to live by the truth? It's a matter of life and death, folks. And by the way, do you know where the truth is found? Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth, is what Jesus said. The word of God, the written word of God is truth. We cannot trust the traditions of men as being truth. We must con compare all of the traditions that men have with what God says in His holy word. By the way, Jesus also said, uh, that Satan was going to try and counterfeit his coming. Notice Matthew chapter 24 and verses 23 to 27. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not what? Do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show what? We just read that in 2 Thessalonians 2. Show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And then Jesus says, see, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Is Jesus coming to this earth to settle down here? No. We are going to gather to him. He is not going to gather to us. So what if... Uh, a majestic being appears all over the world, uh, you know, and he performs miracles and signs and wonders, and he's dazzling, and he speaks beautiful words, and he says that Sunday is the day that we're supposed to keep. How many people would be deceived? Probably most of the world, because they would not compare what this individual teaches with what the Word of God says. Ellen White, in Signs of the Times, May 18, 1882, uh, referring to this strong delusion that God is going to send it's not actually God that sends it. God simply removes His presence, and as a result, they're deluded by what they chose. She says this, Because the children of men reject the plainest teachings of His Word and trample upon His law, God leaves them to choose that which they desire. They spurn the truth, and He permits them to believe a lie. They refuse to yield to the convictions of the Holy Spirit, and Satan, transforming himself into an angel of light, leads them captive at his will. If men, listen carefully, if men were but conversant with the Word of God and obedient to its teachings, they could not be thus deceived. But they neglect the great what? The great detector of fraud. And the mind becomes confused and corrupted with the deceptive arts of men and the secret power of the Father's Father of lies. Does the Bible tell us how Jesus will come? The Bible tells us very clearly how Jesus will come. Is it important to know how Jesus will come? You better believe it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, we're told how Jesus is going to come. Jesus is not going to touch this earth when He comes. But do you know, most every Christian in the world believes that when Jesus comes, He's going to settle here in this earth for a thousand years. The millennium is going to be here on earth, they believe. So they'll be ready to accept the overmastering delusion of the devil when the devil appears disguised as Christ. Because they're expecting Christ to come all the way to the earth and to spend a thousand years here. Notice 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, 
that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be what? Ah, there it is, shall be caught up together with them, that is, who, those who died and resurrected, with them, where? In the clouds, to meet the Lord, where? In the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Did Jesus promise to take His people to heaven? Yes, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So when Jesus comes again, He's going to take His people to heaven. He's not going to come down to the earth. His feet are not going to touch the earth. Notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31. Matthew 24 and verse 31. Notice this is a very important verse because it tells us that Jesus is not going to come to this earth and then He's going to spend uh, a thousand years here on earth. It says there in Matthew 24 verse 31 at the conclusion of the second coming, and He will send His angels. What is He going to do? He's going to send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one, one end of the heaven to another. So is Jesus going to come all the way down to the earth and he's, you know, everybody's going to come to Him? No, no, no. It says here that, he, that Jesus is going to be above the earth. He's going to send His angels and His angels will gather the people and they will be caught up as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4 in the air to meet the Lord in the air. Now in conclusion, let me just read you how Ellen White describes this counterfeit second coming of Satan. It's amazing. It's found in Great Controversy, page 625. She says, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear Notice that's uh, to your eyes, right? We'll make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. You just read Revelation 1 verses 13 through 15. It says his face, his face shines like the sun and his legs are like burnished bronze, you know, and he's uh, clothed in a white robe of light. That's the way the devil is going to look. Just like the description of Jesus in Revelation 1. She continues saying, The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come, Christ has come. The, the people prostrate themselves in adoration before Him because they're expecting Him to come all the way down to the earth, folks. They, the people prostrate themselves in adoration before Him while He lifts up His hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed His disciples when He was upon the earth. Now notice, He's not going to say, I am the Christ. No, He's going to speak beautiful words like Jesus in a soft voice. It says his voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming His name by refusing to listen to His angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. But the people of God will not be misled. Why not? The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the Scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. Two ways in which people are going to know that this is not Christ. It's not by their feelings or emotions or their eyes or their ears or you know what people say. There are two ways in which you're going to know that this is not Christ. Number one, because the way in which he comes is not the way in which the Bible says Jesus is going to come. 
this individual will appear in different parts of the earth. The Bible says that every eye will see Jesus simultaneously. This individual will walk upon the earth. The Bible says that Jesus will stay in the air. He will not touch the earth. And furthermore, the teachings of this false Christ are not in harmony with the word of God. He's going to say Sunday is the day that we're supposed to keep. When the Bible says that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So folks, what will be the only protection for God's people at the end of time? It will be implicit trust in the written word of God as it appears in the Bible. Ellen White in the book Christ Triumphant, page 331, had this to say, It is the word of the living God that is to decide all controversies. The word of God. A thus saith the Lord, it is written, as Jesus told the devil three times in the wilderness, will be the only protection for God's people. Not traditions, feelings, and emotions, but what God has said.